Greetings, I'm Matthew Coolidge. I'm the director of the Center for Land Use Interpretation, and I'll be presenting on uh, Owens Lake's industrial history, as well as its interpretive infrastructure and its potential significance. I direct an unusual organization, I suppose you could say, the Center for Land Use Interpretation. Unusual in that we have our own way of looking at the the landscape of the country as a in its totality as a kind of a cultural product. And I'm really honored to speak in this format uh, with the Society of Industrial Archaeology. It's an institution that we, the, the, the organizational, we have been aware of for a long time. I have too. And, and uh, I find inspiration in your methods and activities. So, so I'm honored to be here. I feel like we cover some of the same ground, though in different ways. I would go even further, perhaps, to suggest that just about the entire landscape of the USA is, and most of what it's composed of, is an industrial artifact. Uh, and uh, examining and interpreting these artifacts is the process of drawing cultural meaning from matter. And this is the task of archaeologists of all stripes. Um, but uh, we've been around since. 1994, we're a research-based organization that produces information resources and tells stories about the various cultures of the USA as expressed in the landscape. We do exhibits that are usually part of some thematic exploration involving bus tours. We do lectures, films, art installations, field workshops, classes, most of which are described on our website and distilled into our searchable map of unusual exemplary land use sites in the USA. Uh, we've done projects all over the USA, about places all over the USA, from Dead Horse, Alaska, to the mouth of the Mississippi River, uh, from the border fence of Mexico to the US-Canada border cut line. We've operated out of field offices and exhibit spaces, numerous locations like the Houston Ship Channel, the Bonneville Salt Flats of Utah, Granite City, Illinois, center of the USA, Lebanon, Kansas, which is where this image is, depicts the, the, the monument and, and our exhibition trailer there. For years, we operated an office and exhibit space in Troy, New York, while producing programs about that region including a kind of treasure map of New Jersey's Meadowlands and an exhibit and book about the Hudson River. We often look to the water here and elsewhere following streams of development, industry, and thought. As it was often the rivers that determined the course of empire of the USA nowhere more so than up the Hudson. And though through the Erie Canal, and which is sort of, this region is really the, the domain of classic industrial archeology. span uh, The gas, old gas holder building in South Troy is actually depicted in the logo of the Society for Industrial Archeology. span And by curious coincidence, it's also where we stored our boat. Since 1996, our headquarters has been in Los Angeles for many reasons, but also because it represents the destination as opposed to the origin of the contemporary USA. If New York is the great city of the East with its historical ties to Europe and US is built over the 19th and 20th century, early 20th century. Then Los Angeles is the great city of the West, built as a result of those financial and industrial resources and the city of the future, as they say. You know, we all do apologies to San Francisco, Seattle, and other places. But Los Angeles is the byproduct of all the work conquering the natives' domestic colonization, growth of American economic and cultural sovereignty that expanded globally especially during and after World War II, and extending westward across the Pacific, to which America is now tied economically in a complex geopolitical supply chain through the gaping mouth of the port of Los Angeles. 
California is the place where American manifest destinarians made it to into the setting sun over the Pacific and where we turned around to consider what we had done to get there, where the hopes and aspirations met reality, where the rubber met the road. Now at the limit, it's no longer about expansion, but about unpacking the past to understand the present, figuring out how we got here as a nation and uh, so we can deal with the future. This polarity, if you will, this dialectic between East and West runs through much of what we do at the center and enveloping deeper dichotomies as well, like here, there, then, now, cause, effect, up, down, hot, cold, wet, dry, urban, rural. Hence our perpetual interest in Owens Lake. Owens Lake is the antipode to Los Angeles. It is Chinatown. It's famously dried up. The, is the uh, Los Angeles aqueduct sucked the water uh, up entirely almost and put it in a pipeline to grow the city of Los Angeles 200 miles away. Gravity driven like a drain, it spills into the city at Cascades, which are on the north rim of the San Fernando Valley, filling the basin like a basin. It is in fact two parallel pipelines, the gravity fed one built in 1913 and another in 1970, which extended the watershed of Los Angeles 100 miles further into the Mono Basin. It should also be noted, though, that the DWP's Owens Valley pipelines are just one of three water systems making the megacity of Los Angeles, the Southland, as some people call it, the 20 million people possible. The others being the State Water Project, which pumps Northern California water thousands of feet over the Tehachapi's, and the Colorado River Aqueduct bringing water across the desert from that river and extending the watershed of Los Angeles hundreds of miles further into Northern Colorado. California is likely the most plumbed place in the nation, if not the world. For every action, as we know, there's an equal and opposite reaction and the wetting of one place means the drying out of another. It took several years for Owens Lake to dry up as a result of the pipeline, but by the 1920s, it had become a dust bowl, uh, eventually called the largest point source of particulate air pollution in the United States. The Department of Water and Power was violating federal air pollution standards and was sued by the local air quality management district and eventually compelled to develop a workable plan to reduce the dust, which began in physically in the 1990s. How to remake a hundred square mile lake with as little water as possible. Turns out to be an industrial process that has cost $2 billion, most of it taking place over the most emissive 40% or so of the lake along an arc that extends from the south east and northern sides as depicted on this graphic. The middle of the lake is still a basin for absorbing the floods that could in an especially dramatic rain or snow event, snow melt event, overwhelm the department's aqueduct capacity, something that seems less and less likely. The creation of these dust control measures, some more successful than others, and all subject to change based on their effectiveness make for an unusual looking kind of extraterrestrial landscape. Shallow flooded brine pools, curving tillage, uniform ridges, non-uniform meandering ridges, sprinkler irrigation, shallow flooding with islands and gravel, lots and lots of gravel. These monolithic machinescapes are punctuated by a menagerie of apparatus, appliances and appurtenances for monitoring, data logging, piping, 
pumping, pressurizing, diverting, flooding, and a variety of other functions. At times obscure and even gestural. All this requires clusters of office trailers at a number of locations, and maintenance compounds with unusual machinery Meanwhile, on the margins of the lake are the vestiges of the history of the industries of the lake, spared from the great erasure and transformation of the lake bed. The Pittsburgh plate glass plant, where PPG, the company from Pittsburgh, they mined the exposed lake bed for minerals into the 1970s. The lake has been in private, the site, I mean, has been in private hands for decades, cut off from the grid by the Department of Water and Power and has housed a curious slate of activities after its closure as a plant, including a contingent of West Hollywood bikers and cat fanciers who lived there, former actors, heart valve research, and the plant was used as a musical instrument and a giant camera obscura by a group of Los Angeles artists known as Metabolic Studio. Also on the edge of the lake is the access into the, the mines run by the Rio Tinto company now, where they extract trona from the lake bed, shipping it by truck to its plant in Boron, California, in the Antelope Valley, home of the state's largest open pit mine. At Cartago, the exposed lake bed sediment was also processed at a potash plant on the lake's southwestern shore, the facility was abandoned and demolished by the 1970s. Crystal Geyser is one of the most popular bottled water brands in the country and has operated wells and a bottling plant on the shores of Owens Lake since the 1990s. It, it's the primary source for the brand in Southern California. Its trucks run down the highway, paralleling the aqueduct all the way to Los Angeles. The slopes of the hills on the northeast side of the lake are dug out by numerous dolomite mines. The white rock has been extracted from here since the late 1800s and continues to be. This is the largest dolomite marble mine in the nation, at least so says the plaque on the piece of dolomite. This dolomite rock a few miles away with a plaque described Cerro Gordo, uh, which was a site a few miles up in the mountains that was the central to point for all the industries in the region. Uh, the Cerro Gordo was a mining area for silver, lead, and zinc starting in the 1860s and continuing into the early 1900s. Silver and lead bullion from here was taken to San Pedro, the precursor to the port of Los Angeles, and then was shipped further by boat to other cities like San Francisco to be further refined. The mines of Cerro Gordo are said to have been one of the first major early industries in Southern California, helping to develop the city of Los Angeles as a port city. Cerro Gordo's mining also led to the creation of short-lived ports along the shores of Owens Lake. The mines were on the east side of the lake, where there was little in the way of trees or timbers or fuel for smelters. However, on the west side of the lake is the Sierras with some of the largest trees in the world. The, the sawmill and flume were built along Cottonwood Creek and charcoal kilns depicted here were built there where the creek met the lake shore and where a landing allowed ships to take these materials across the lake. The remnants of the charcoal kilns from 1873 are preserved though their historic plaque comes and goes. There were four other small ports on Owens Lake. In addition to the landing at Cottonwood Creek, they all existed to move wood, charcoal, and supplies to the mines at Cerro Gordo and to take bullion from the mines and smelters to the southern port, Cartago, where Teamsters 
took it south to Los Angeles by road. Shipping across the lake saves days off the overland routes, which were treacherous with marsh, mud, and sand dunes. The first of two boats that plied the waters of the lake was the Bessie Brady. It was built on the lake shore where the Owens River enters the lake at the north end, and it had its maiden voyage in June 1872. It was 85 feet long, 16 feet wide, and was said to be capable of carrying 70 tons, driven by a 20 horsepower steam engine and a propeller. The second boat, the Molly Stevens, was built a few years later, but was less useful and, and sank. By most accounts, these were the only powered vessels ever used on the lake before it dried up. The Bessie Brady was commissioned by James Brady, who was the superintendent of the Owens Lake Silver and Lead Furnace, which was built near the shore at Swansea in 1869. The furnace smelted ore from his company's mines in Cerro Gordo, and the Bessie Brady made his company successful by getting bullion to the Teamsters across the lake faster and in much greater quantity than other furnaces, which were run by the other companies operating it at uh, Cerro Gordo. He was soon forced into insolvency, however, by nefarious acts of the bigger mining company and was forced to sell the Bessie Brady to them. The boat was moved to their new landing at Keeler, a few miles south of Swansea. By the time it was bankrupt, just a few years after it had opened, Brady's silver and lead furnace and most of the town of Swansea around it was destroyed in a flash flood and mud flow in 1874 and it was not rebuilt. Though there was some later activity at Swansea in the early 20th century when an aerial tram was built bringing salt from a dry lake on the other side of the mountains, the remains of Swansea are few and, and buried in blown sand. A cluster of some structures remains, including Brady's small adobe house and several later buildings in a deteriorated state and some old trucks and cars, including a crushed Pontiac Bonneville. Uh, what remains of the first dock on Owens Lake, where the Bessie Brady was birthed at Swansea, may be this structure, but we're not entirely sure yet. Some office trailers have recently appeared in the dunes at Swansea. These were brought in not by the Department of Water and Power, but by us, uh, the Center for Land Use Interpretation. One we call the Land Observatory. It's an observatory that rather than look at the sky from the land, it looks at the land from the sky. Inside is a lobby where visitors can check themselves in and refresh with a cup from the water cooler that we keep filled with Department of Water and Power tap water from Los Angeles. The main room features aesthetic kinetic displays scratching the surface of the remarkable vocabulary of forms at Owens Lake. The current archaeology, in a sense, of our industrial society. Thanks so much. Happy to answer any questions.